So we're talking about what are some things that have changed in your lifetime uh, in various areas. Well, who remembers when seat belts were a thing that were kind of buried under the seats because you didn't need them at all? We, we, I remember as a little kid running back and forth on the seat. And every so often my parents would hit the brakes and I'd fly into the front. But I remember dad would just throw me in the back like a trout. Like that's <laughs> kind of how it worked. And car seats were not a thing. Today, as a grandparent, this thing can give you a hernia. It is so heavy. When I strap my grandchild in this, I feel like I'm putting them in a NASCAR or something. They're going to go 300 kilometers an hour. But that was something that didn't exist in the past. How about bike helmets? Anyone grow up as a, as a child, no bike helmet? Yeah. When our kids first came along and started riding, it still wasn't a law. And then these really hard molded styrofoam things came out. I guess they were better than nothing, but I, I could never see the value of them until our youngest was four years old and he was a very, very skinny little guy. And uh, the four of, or five of us were out for a bike ride and, and the kids had their helmets on. And we got off our bikes and we were walking around and he was so skinny he fell through a sewer grate, but the helmet caught him. Okay, that is a joke, but... Um, <laughs> The other one that I thought of was skateboarding. Now, who, who here in their lifetime was like really into skateboarding? Okay, I thought some of the older crowd because when I was young, skateboarding was a big thing, but they were very different skateboards. You couldn't do these heel kicks and flip kicks and all these things. You did, you did handstands on them, you did slalom, you, you high jumped and jumped back on them, and you didn't wear any protective equipment. The point was, when you fell, you got hurt, so you never did it again. <laughs> Today, I've gone past these skate parks, and some of the kids look like they're armed to disarm a nuclear device. They have so many, protect, so much protective equipment on. That has changed. But the big one, now that I'm a grandpa taking kids to the park again, is the playground. The slides today are, what, about five feet high? Mm -hmm made of some kind of plastic that the kids actually can't slide. It's more of a scoot for a, about 30 centimeters and scoot and scoot. It's not a slide. Back in our day, slides were five stories high. <laughs> they were a steel structure that got up to about 250 degrees Fahrenheit on a summer day. When you went down, you lost at least two layers of skin because of the heat. And another layer when you skim like a flat rock on a pond on the ground. I mean, they were wonderful. <laughs> Things have changed. And w with my grandkids, I want to give them like a really good push down the five foot slide so they actually feel the exhilaration of sliding. <laughs> but of course, there'll be someone with a camera saying, go ahead, old man, this will be a viral video in minutes, right? <laughs> Things have changed. Acts 10 is about change. It's all about change. We said this last week, it, it, it's less about Cornelius and, and Peter and angels and visions and praying and types of food. It is about the importance of the gospel and the big change that the gospel is now coming to the Gentiles. And I did a, a, a really quick review of, of, of Acts and thought, well, has it not come to the Gentiles already? In Acts 8, it came to the Samaritans. And, and you think of the, the Hebrew Jewish Christians. They're thinking, okay, we can accept that they're half Jews. Right? Because Samaritans were half Jews. The same father, Abraham, was the father of both the Jews and the Samaritans. So let's write a new policy. Half Jews are welcome. But then you go a little further in Acts 8, and we saw the Ethiopian eunuch comes to faith. Well, he's not Jewish. He's not Samaritan. He's definitely Gentile. Oh, but he's a converted Jew. He did convert to Judaism. Okay, let's write a new policy. Half Jews are allowed. Converted Jews are allowed. As long as they're Jew-ish. You see what I did there? It wasn't meant to be funny, so don't laugh. But, but they're Jew-ish. But, but they're holding out on non-Jews. Like so much so that even though this happens in Acts 10, the gospel comes to the Gentiles. By Acts 15, 
The Jewish Christians literally say, we need a summit. We need all the leaders. And some of the prominent Jewish leaders, Christian Jewish leaders said, uh, we'll let Gentiles become Christians, but they've got to keep the laws of, them, of Moses, and they need to be circumcised if they're men. And God's spirit through other godly leaders said, no, that's not what's happening. Change has come. After about 1,500 years, change has come. I call this section, as Doris mentioned, when God messes with our categories. And he's really going to mess with Jewish Christians and, and Peter specifically his categories. And because repetition is the mother of learning, we've already heard the text, but let's walk through the text. And, and may God's spirit do what he wants as he walks through our lives this morning. So in verse 9, uh, we had Laura read from verse 7 to get the context. Cornelius sends these three men, his, his servants, right? But in verse 9 it says, About noon the following day, as they, the servants sent by Cornelius, were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. And uh, uh, next Sunday, God willing, Matt and Hanukkah will be with us from Amman, Jordan. They're, uh, they're going to be on their way in transit at the end of the week. And their previous place, not the one they're in now, but the previous place had a rooftop room or area and we've got some really wonderful pictures of you know the visuals from there so this is a common thing in the Middle East even to this day and uh, I thought of how when Radiant Church was was being dreamt of and being envisioned we actually had two gatherings for supper and prayer that we called prayer from the perch because we did it on a 21st floor of a big condo in Waterloo where we could look over Kitchener, Waterloo and Kitchener, and pray over the city. And we called it prayer from the perch. And so I wonder if that's what Peter was doing. He went up to look out over the city of Joppa and to just pray for people. Well, what happens in verse 10? He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. I won't ask for a show of hands, but has this ever happened to you? You start praying, you get a little distracted, because your stomach's rumbling, and uh, you hadn't committed to fasting and praying, and Peter obviously hadn't here, and so you feel that hunger. I don't know about you, but uh, pretty convenient to have a servant who's going to prepare a meal for you. So he probably called down and said, hey, whoever is serving today, could you prepare me a meal? Well, it says he fell into a trance, and you might think, well, that's just another word for vision. It's actually not. This is a key word in this text. The word trance in Greek is ek stasis. Out of stasis. Stasis meaning static, no change. He fell into a out of change. Something's going to change. And it literally means a displacement or distraction or disturbance of the mind. So from his regular thinking, he's being disturbed out of that, distracted out of that. Now you might say, he was hungry, it's low blood sugar. <laughs> it, he was up on a roof, maybe it was you know, a dizzying height. You know what, maybe, but God can use those. God can use those. Some of you are calculating, thinking, okay, I'm going to get some low blood sugar, go up high, and maybe I'll fall into a trance, and God will give me a vision. He might. I don't think this is a recipe for how to get a vision from God. It just happened. This is the narrative. Now, basically, though, Peter falls asleep while praying. Now, I will ask for a show of hands. Who here has ever fallen asleep while praying? I definitely have my hand up. I have uh, been on my knees and, uh, and, and fallen asleep, and then I wake up and I think, how did I get asleep? And I actually retraced all the thoughts that I was having before I fell asleep and just wasted a whole lot of time. My mother-in-law, uh, yesterday was her burial up in North Bay, but that was a feature for her. She fell asleep at least once a week on her knees praying. It's not the worst place to fall asleep. But this is what Peter's doing. He's a little bit sleepy while he's praying. In verse 11, in a vision now. This isn't something he physically saw, it's a vision. He saw heaven opened, and something like, so it's not exactly this, but it's something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. 
Now when I look at that, I think, how large is this sheet? We don't know for sure, but look what it contained in the next verse. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. We don't know how many, we don't know what kinds, just all kinds. And reptiles, think about that for a moment. What kind of reptiles? And birds, and my first question is, how did the birds stay contained on the sheet? But we don't have to have an answer, it's a vision, it's like a dream state. Not everything works in your dreams the way they do in the everyday of life, right? Now, I, I could ask, we could pull around and say, who thinks, you know, this vision he had of reptiles and birds and animals is creepy? And, and some would say, yeah, that, that's creepy. Others would say, that's so cool, right? We have those extremes. I know as, as a, a, a person in the church who visits in a lot of homes over the years, uh, I was thinking, what are the most kind of exotic and strange animals that I've ever seen in people's homes? And in Christian's homes, pretty tame. A lot of dogs and cats, a few uh, unusual birds. I remember a big iguana in, in someone's place from Lincoln Road Chapel. Um, when I was in student ministry, it got a little more strange. Uh, ferrets, pet rats, uh, yeah, different things, but I'll tell you, nothing like what I've seen in neighbors' homes. Large spiders, snakes, yet yeah, lots of shaking heads. Creepy things, others again are saying cool things. Well, this is what Peter sees, and then he hears these words. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Now when I read that, I say, isn't something missing? Is there not a missing step here? Shouldn't it be kill, cook, add some barbecue sauce, a pinch of salt, and then eat? There's no cooking step here. But you know what I love about this story? Everything. I really love this story. I love the elaborate plan of God that is going to bring Cornelius to faith in Jesus. It's really an elaborate plan. And I believe that for every one of us, for every one of us who makes our way to Jesus, God has an, or an orchestrated plan. He has an orchestrated plan. When Karen and I were married, around the time the Earth's crust was just thawing years ago, um, Karen's sister was a florist. And so she made a beautiful you know, live bouquet of flowers. And out of it was hanging this beautiful ivy. And so after we came back from our honeymoon, Karen said, let's plant this ivy, and this will be a symbol of our marriage. It will last as long as we're married. About two weeks, and it died. <laughs> so, like I, I checked with her yesterday, how long did it, she said about two weeks. So we bought another one, planted it, and it lasted a good six months, and then we killed it. So we, we said, forget it, just the wedding rings will do, right? <laughs> that, 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 that'll be our symbol. But then, about 20 years ago, we were walking through St. Jacob's Market, and we found some silver rings that had the ichthys, the fish, the Christian fish on them, all around. And we thought, hey, there's a neat common symbol besides our wedding ring. Why don't we get a silver ring each of the Christian fish? And um, so we did that. So fast forward until last May, May of 2021, we were in a lockdown protocol of no more than 10 people allowed to gather outside. And so we went down to Hamilton, Karen and I, for our daughter Ruth Ann's birthday with her husband and their three, our four Colombian friends. So there was eight of us. We ate in the park. Uh, we're throwing Frisbee. And I'm left-handed, but I was having a shoulder issue, so I was throwing right-handed. And wouldn't you know it, my, my fish ring flew off in the deep grass. So there's eight of us on our hands and knees looking for the fish ring couldn't find it. I called it off after 15 minutes. They wouldn't give up, especially the Colombian family. They're like, no, we're going to find this. 45 minutes later, I'm picking people up off the, off the grass, and, and um, Andrea said, tomorrow I will come out all day and I will find it. And he never found it. Three weeks ago, three weeks ago, my son, by marriage, Michael, is out in the park, at the far end of the park, and he sees this couple with a metal detector 
going around. He says, hey, can I tell you a story of what happened with my, my dad last year? Is there any chance you'd come with me to this side of the park and maybe look for his ring? So he said, sure. So they came over, looked around for about five minutes. Michael had to go. He left his phone number with them. About 10 minutes later, his phone rings. We found your dad's ring. It was buried four inches under soil. It had gotten pressed down, but we have it. And he said, great, where, where do you live? I'll come and get it. And you know what? I haven't told my wife yet. She'll be so surprised. She loves meeting new friends, so we'll, we'll, I'll bring her over. So they come over and uh, come to the door, and the guy holds out the ring. There it is. There's the ring. We got it back. And you think, oh, that's a great story. It's just getting better. It's just about to get better. So they, they inv are invited in. And Michael just has this prompt from God's spirit to share with this couple. And you can't judge a book by its cover. They are all tattooed up, big piercings, the big, you know, those extended earring things. And, and uh, they just, they, he just went for it. He said, can I just ask you something? I want, I want to tell you something, but, but I want to ask you first, do you believe in God? And they both said, yeah, we don't know much about God, but we do believe in God. Well, he said, you know, you did something very godlike today. I said, we did? Yeah, you, you really put some effort into finding something valuable. And there's a story Jesus told of a woman who had ten valuable coins. She lost one, and she cleaned her house and lit a lamp until she found it. And then she had a party with her friends to celebrate that that lost coin had been found. And Jesus said, that's like God. He rejoices when a person far from him gets found and is brought home. So that's kind of what you've done. And here we are kind of celebrating together. It's kind of neat. And they said, Jesus said that? That's amazing. And they talked a little bit more about that. And then they had this nice visit. And they went home. And a half an hour later, the lady called and said, is there any chance we could get together again? We want to hear more about this God that you talked about. He sounds amazing. We really do. And they're coming over for dinner. To Michael and Ruth Ann. And I'm thinking, wow, if that's the reason I lost that ring for a year, I am so happy I lost that ring for that reason. But that's God's orchestrated, elaborate plan to pursue people who are lost. And He's pursuing you. I don't know what your journey is that has brought you today to this moment, but God has been in the shadows seeking you. Pursuing your heart, drawing you to Jesus. In fact, in Luke 19 and 10, it says, The Son of Man, Jesus, is come, has come to seek and to save the lost. We're going to learn here in a minute. Peter is 56 kilometers away from Cornelius. And yet, God's Spirit is going to orchestrate getting him to his soon to be brother in the family of God. Why? Because God has a plan for a seeking Savior and a seeking sinner to meet. Are you seeking Jesus? If you are, it's because he's seeking you. Now, in the next verse, we're going to see, oh, beloved Peter, he's going to make it difficult even for God. <laughs> Look what he says. Surely not, Lord. Kill and eat, Peter. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. Now, when you look at those words, surely not, Lord, they are a perfect contradiction. You can say, surely not, and you can say, Lord. But whenever you put those two words together, there's a massive disconnect to say, surely not, Lord. But this is Peter. And I look back, and I won't share them all, but there's at least four occasions when he basically did this with Jesus. But, but the big one is just before the cross. Uh, Jesus told his disciples he was going to the cross. And Peter literally says, not so, Lord. Not so, Lord. Does anyone know what Jesus' response to Peter was in that, that moment? Get behind me. Get behind me, Satan. When Jesus calls you Satan, you know that it's never good. Right? Now, we raise an eyebrow at Peter. But are you more like Peter or less like Peter? When God says to you, 
when God says to me, when God says to us, do this thing I'm asking of you, do you say, surely not, Lord. Surely not, Lord. Lord, I have my way of doing things. Is the sound on, Claire? Is the sound on for here? Yep. Okay. Um, I have my way of doing things. I have my way of thinking about things. I subscribe to the Frank Sinatra School of Life. I did it my way. Right? That's, that's our theme song, if we're honest. I do it my way. Jesus said this, though. Why do you call me Lord and do not do the things I ask of you? Like, don't call me Lord if you're really prepared to say not so. Yes, Lord, whatever you say, Lord, those are perfectly good options. But not so, Lord, or surely not, Lord, they just don't compute. Now, having said that, do we see how repugnant and how repulsive this was to Peter as a Jewish person? He's being asked to, to eat like reptiles and, and, and unclean animals. Peter is living in the historical legacy of generations of forefathers and foremothers who for, by my count, 1,478 years have done things a certain way. In this case, they have only eaten food from a very specific menu of clean foods and have never eaten from a very specific off-the-menu list of unclean foods. I'm not going to take the time to... to share the list, but if you're interested, write them down. Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14. That's the list of clean and unclean. Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14. But here's the point. Change is hard. You say, but but wait a minute. This is God-ordained change to Peter. Yeah, change is still hard. And I so appreciated uh, your comments, Doris, about, you know, the the potential merger and, and um, the idea of change. And for those, get, those who are guests here today, uh, next weekend, the 19th, will be exactly eight months since Grace and Radiant have been meeting together on Sunday mornings. And both Grace and Radiant have not been doing our thing our way for 1,478 years. We have not quite that long. But change is still hard. Change is hard. Enough said. Verse 15, the voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. The voice is calling for change in Peter. See, this is not about changing Peter's diet. This is about changing Peter's heart. That's what this is all about. This is God doing in Peter what he's also doing in your life and mine. He wants to change our hearts. Our sinful hearts, he wants to change them through the cross and forgiveness and grace. And our broken hearts, he wants to change them through love. Through his love. He wants to change our hearts. I mean, back to the elaborate plan here. Why get Peter? Why get Peter? Remember, Cornelius is in Caesarea. Peter is 56 kilometers south in Joppa. Why get Peter? Uh, Why not get Philip? If you remember back in chapter 8, after Philip leads the Ethiopian eunuch to faith in Jesus, it says he made his way to Caesarea. Well, was he just visiting Caesarea? I, I looked ahead in Acts 21, when Paul is going back to Jerusalem, he stops in Caesarea, and it says, quote, he stayed at the house of Philip the evangelist. Philip lived in Caesarea, and he's an evangelist. Why would the Spirit of God not say, here's Cornelius, just down the street and around the corner is Philip. Why Peter? Because Peter, sorry, God is going to change Peter's heart. As a leader in the early Jewish church, it was so important to change Peter's heart. And God will go to great lengths to change your hearts. And like Peter, we resist him, but God persists in the face of our resistance. And God is challenging Peter. Now listen to this. God is challenging Peter to act his way into a better way of feeling 
before he feels his way into a better way of acting. Do you need me to rewind that? God is challenging Peter to act his way into a better way of feeling about the whole thing than to try and feel his way into a better way of acting. It starts often with taking action. Well, verse 16. This happened three times. Now, we're assuming the letting of the sheet down and back up and down and back up three times. Or maybe it was kill and eat three times. In fact, I've kind of laughed at the idea that maybe it was the words three times. It was kill and eat, Peter. No, Lord. Kill and eat, Peter. No, Lord. Kill and eat, Peter. And Peter's thinking something happened in threes that didn't go well in the past. I think I better listen. <laughs> right? This, this three times could be a reference back to Peter denying Jesus. We, we don't know. It could be, another option would, would be that Peter was restored to Jesus through Jesus asking him three times, do you love me? So it could be a connection there. But keep reading, and I think we'll discover why three times. I really subscribe to the principle of interpreting the Bible that if the plain sense makes sense, then any other sense is nonsense. And I think there's really plain sense coming in just a few verses. Look at verse 17. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. Now, isn't this interesting that the men found where Simon's house was? How did they do that? Either, either, one, they stopped and asked for directions. Wait, they're men. That didn't happen. Right? That didn't happen. Sorry, guys, I just threw all of the guys under the bus, but it's true. Or secondly, Ralph, you, you, you yelled it out, but you said it to me last week, and I really liked it. Smell. The tanner's house would be all dead animal skins, carcasses that he would have to get rid of. There would be quite a stench coming from them. Maybe that's how they found it. I like that suggestion, Ralph. Could be how they found it. So, which also brings up, what's Peter doing? at a house where there's dead animals. So that was against Jewish law as well. So that's interesting. Look at verse 18. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there while Peter was still thinking about the vision. Isn't that fascinating? In verse 17, Peter was wondering about the meaning. Verse 19, he's thinking about, he's, he's deep in thought about this vision. And you and I would be too. But then look what it says. The spirit said to him, Simon, three men. Are looking for you. Ah, uh, why did the sheet float down three times? Why did the voice maybe say three times kill and eat? Because in minutes, not one Gentile, not two Gentiles, but three Gentiles. The elaborate plan of God. Isn't this amazing? God's elaborate, beautiful plan. It's not a coincidence. God is working his plan. Verse 20. So to Peter he says, get up. And go downstairs, do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Aren't you on the edge of your seat? How is Peter going to respond? Is he going to do it again? Not so, Lord. Let, let's see what he says. Peter went down. How could he not with this evidence that has been given to him? That God is in this. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? See, he has no idea. He has no idea about Cornelius. He is not privy to that information at all. The men replied, and, and we know the story. Cornelius sent us, and so on. Um, what we're about to read, though, is huge. This next verse looks so sedentary, but it's so important. Look at verse 23. Then Peter invited the men into his house to be his guests. I don't think we realize how big that is. This is crossing a massive barrier. Jews and Gentiles staying together as guests and hosts under one roof. This is a huge statement. The next day, so they stayed overnight with Peter. The next day, Peter started out with them and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, so it's a two-day trip, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Jesus entered the house, Cornelius met him, 
fell at his feet in reverence, but Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man. That word reverence is much stronger than just that word. It's the word worship. Sixty, sixty, six zero times it appears in the New Testament. And I'll just tell you two of them. Uh, one is when the wise men bow on their knees before two-year-old baby Jesus, and they worship him. It's a very strong word. It is the same word that Satan uses when tempting Jesus, and he says, Just bow down and worship me, and I'll give you everything. So Cornelius is worshiping. This is man worship. This is sometimes what happens in the church, sadly. And around the world in various religions is the the leader, the speaker, gets worshipped as though he's some god on earth. And later we're going to see in Acts where they literally thought that Paul and Barnabas were gods. But he lifts him up. In fact, the word literally is, but Peter helped him up or pulled him up. So here's burly fisherman Peter picking up this Roman centurion. Get up off your feet, man. I am just a human being. Love Peter's humility here. Verse 27. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. Now he's expecting, I'm going to go meet with a man named Cornelius. But this large group of people, and then this is a preacher's dream here. He said to them, you're well, oh sorry, it's coming in a verse or two. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. I smiled at this. After Peter gets a a nice, welcome Peter, he says, "Um, you know, I actually shouldn't be here. (laughs) I shouldn't be here. I'm a card-carrying Jewish person, and you're all Gentiles. I shouldn't even be here. But what comes next? What comes next? I, I honestly think that, that in heaven there was a bit of a celebration. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Can't you hear the angel saying, Peter's had a change of heart. Yes, let's celebrate. Let's celebrate. That's not actually far-fetched. Jesus said whenever someone repents and comes to him, there's a, there's a party in heaven in the presence of God and the angels. Look at verse 29. So when I was sent for, Peter says, I came without raising any objection. Try not to be too humble there, Peter. You've, you've blown it a few times, but a little bit of humility here. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour. At three in the afternoon, suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer, remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who's called Peter. He's a guest of Simon the Tanner who lives by the sea. I got to tell you something. I pushed back from my desk and worshiped God when I was looking at this. Joppa? I was thinking, where have I heard Joppa before? Talk about God's big, elaborate plan. The first missionary in the entire Bible is God. The second missionary in the Bible would be Abram, or Abraham, when he was sent from Ur of the Chaldees to be a blessing to the world. But the true first missionary to the Gentiles was Jonah. You remember that story, Jonah? He's to go to Nineveh. But he doesn't want to go to Nineveh. He doesn't want these Gentiles to come to God. He doesn't want them forgiven. They were such evil, wicked people. And he's so bigoted and so prejudiced against them that he goes to Tarshish, but he gets on a boat. Does anyone know where the boat launched from? Joppa. Joppa. The very place where there was this this exclusion of Gentiles in the heart of a Jewish leader. God says there's going to be inclusion of Gentiles in that very place. Isn't that amazing? That is so astounding that hundreds and hundreds of years later, and not only that, do you know what Peter's full name is? Simon, son of Jonah. Jonah. There's a connection. Oh, God's elaborate plan. Amazing. The final verse. So I sent for you immediately, Cornelius says, and it was good of you to come. Now we're all here. This is a preacher's dream right here. We're all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. That's what most of you say on a Sunday morning, right? No. Okay. Some of you do. Some of you do. 
Hopefully all of us do. Well, in closing, I pray that God is messing with your categories as he is with mine this morning. Like Peter, God's spirit is calling for us to do something. And so here's three suggestions of how to respond to this message this morning. Number one, say yes to Jesus. Whatever it is that he's prompting in your heart and your spirit right now, say yes. Just about everyone in this story, I mean a few speed bumps with Peter, but everyone in the story says yes to Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Lord. He's inviting you today to come to him for forgiveness, to become a child of his. Will you say yes to that? He, he's, he's calling you to, to lead your life, to be your leader, for you to surrender leadership to him. Will you say yes, Lord, to him? Secondly, especially if you are someone who does not know Jesus, but you're a spiritual explorer, say yes to inviting someone into your journey toward Jesus. That, that's what Cornelius did. He, he knew he wanted to know more because he'd had this revelation in, a, in a, a dream and through an angel, but he invited someone into that journey toward Jesus. And I pray that if you're an explorer, that you do that today. And then thirdly, if you are a follower of Jesus... Would you say yes to helping someone in their journey toward Jesus? And that's, that's what Peter ultimately did. He finally said yes to God. I don't know where this lands on you this morning, but I pray that God's Spirit will be challenging you and that you will respond in the affirmative and say yes to him. And for 2,000 years... Christians have been saying yes to something Jesus commanded us, and that is communion, or the Lord's table, the Lord's supper. This morning, Jesus is saying what he said 2,000 years ago, whenever you take a piece of bread, it speaks of my body that was given for you. Whenever you take a sip of juice or wine, it represents my blood that was shed for you. And then he said, do this to remember me. And we either say yes or we say no to that. This morning he's inviting us to say yes. And when I think of those words, do this to remember me, there's really three meanings that theologians have seen over the years for what did Jesus mean, remember me? It means one of three things. One is the one that we most often think of, don't forget me. Jesus is saying, don't, don't ever forget the story what I did for you. And that's what we do when we say yes and take communion. We remember Jesus. Secondly, though, and I think this is, this is where I would lean in, would be it's a judicial statement. When you take communion, you're coming before God and you're saying, I'm remembering Jesus to the Father. He's my reason for forgiveness. I'm remembering him to God. I have no other avenue toward a relationship with God but Jesus, and I'm remembering him to God. But the third one, while I, I believe the second one's probably what it means, I really lean into and love this third one, and it is this. When Jesus died on the cross, there's a sense in which he was dismembered. His blood was separated from his body. And when we have communion, we remember we remember Jesus, that reassembling of his body and blood. He's alive. He's fully alive, back from the dead today. There's, this, there's that sense in which we remember, remember him. Why don't we pray, and then we're going to take communion this morning. Heavenly Father, as we... Uh, think about this table and what it represents. Lord, we recognize that, that here this morning in person and online, some of us know you and have known you for a while. And Lord, may we say yes to Jesus and come and remember him the way he's asked us to. Father, for others uh, who are exploring who Jesus is and what their relationship might be to him, Father, I pray that even today, today might be the day when they would 
would say, yes, Jesus, I, I acknowledge I'm, I'm a sinner for whom you died, and I'm seeking you, and I know you're seeking me, and I receive you now as my Lord, my King, and my Savior. And Father, for those, God, may they hear Jesus inviting them to come and take communion for the first time this morning. If you're here this morning and you're exploring, but you haven't taken that step of, of inviting Jesus into your life, he's actually asked that, that believers, this is, a, this is a, a thing that believers do, and so um, you're welcome to just sit and reflect on what is happening here this morning and not participate. But God, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the offering and the gift and the sacrifice that he made on our behalf take away our sin. And Father, thank you for the elaborate plan in your heart to bring us to you. Thank you for those people in our life who ever spoke the gospel and lived out the gospel in our lives. And we just thank you now that Jesus ever became real to us and became our Savior. We thank you for this communion time and these elements in his name.